Governor Jim Edgar, so good to see you again. It's been a long time since we've had a chance to uh, catch up, and we want to be t talking to you uh, about a variety of things, uh, get your perspective on some of the things going on in the state of Illinois, perhaps in the nation. But uh, if we can, it's amazing to me to think, and I was just thinking about this before we started, that it's been 24 years now since you left office. So there's probably a number of people in Illinois who are old enough that they don't remember when you were governor and what you did. But let's let's start off with just, uh, can you give us an update? We're talking to you from, uh, you're in Colorado today. But wh what are you doing these days uh, in life? Where are you living and what are you working on? In fact, I was thinking this morning, it was 25 years ago, I presided over my last state fair, That's which right. is something as a governor, you may not think much about to become governor, but that that's a time consuming and it's an interesting part of the job. Uh, after I left the governorship, uh, I was fortunate the uh, University of Illinois had me come over there and I always tell people they gave me the title distinguished fellow and I wanted to take the job because after being in Illinois politics for 30 years, if somebody would call you distinguished, you, you want to take advantage of that. So, uh, and I got a chance to, uh, talk with uh, college students, both at U of I and other universities around the state, which I enjoy very much. Uh, I enjoy uh, kind of trying to stimulate young people into being involved in the political process and in government. Uh, and I also like to hear what they think the priorities are. And so that's that's been a rewarding experience the last almost well, 24 years now of uh, being around young people. Uh, I'm not formally with the university anymore. I, I still have an office over there, but I do have a program that we started about 10 years ago called the Edgar Fellows, uh, which we work with uh, people already in the governmental political arena. And we try to get them, first of all, to get to know each other. Uh, one of the things that struck me that people in politics today and in government particularly, they don't know each other as well as they used to. They're, the polarization and uh, particularly at the federal level, they I don't think they know each other. State level, still to some extent they do. But we try to get them to know each other and to realize while they might be a Republican or a Democrat, they might be from Chicago or Southern Illinois, they really have a lot more in common than they do differences. And they probably agree on a lot more things than that they realize. And to try to get them to recognize the other point of view, the other person's point of view, uh, see if they can't find common ground when they're trying to solve problems. Uh, now, I can't say that we've been totally successful. Things are still very polarized in politics today. That's a government. That's a big difference than when I was involved 25 years ago. Uh, but I think we've, we've seen some improvement. Uh, we do have stories of Republican and Democratic legislators who'd been at Edgar Fellows and got to know each other, working together on issues that maybe they wouldn't have before. So that's that takes my some of my time now, but pretty much I'm retired. <clears throat> As you mentioned, I'm in Colorado. We spend summer months in Colorado. That's where both of our kids, Brad and Elizabeth, settled, and meaning all our grandkids are out here, though. Four of our five grandkids are now graduated from college and they're scattering to the all parts of the country. So uh, we don't get to see them quite as much as we used to, but we do spend time in Colorado. And in the winter months, I'm, I don't like color. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time in Arizona. Uh, I was now, thinking we'll, about we, that too, because I saw today it's like 118. In yeah, now we don't Arizona. go there in the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we, we go, and it was actually a cold for, Southern Arizona this last winter was cold. Uh, it still was better than the warm winter that Illinois had as far as temperatures. But uh, so we, we go back and forth. Uh, Brenda is convinced that she married a gypsy. I'm always traveling someplace. Uh, she thought maybe I'd get over that after I got out of office, but I, I still, uh, we still get packed and go places. It's a fact we're getting ready uh, in a couple of days to pack up and drive back to Illinois for the the rest of the summer and the fall. So you have a, a what, a home in, uh, is it in Urbana or are you in Springfield these days? No, we're in Springfield. We, uh, about 
10, 12 years ago, uh, I decided I was going to, in my uh, self-imposed exile from Springfield, we moved back uh, when I started reducing my role at the university. Uh, so we, we've been back for more than 10 years now. And uh, I, I, you know, a lot of people love champagne and it's fine. I love Springfield. I, that's where I spent most of my adult life. We raised our kids in Springfield and uh, did most of my work in Springfield. So I think you I, lived I in Chatham, in didn't, didn't you live in Chatham? Or? Well, we were in Springfield city limits, okay. but we were in the Chatham school district. I was going to say, I, uh, I'm which, living uh, in Chatham. My kids it was inter Chatham. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk about uh, Edgar Fellows and trying to get people to work together and understand the importance of it, because just today, and as you and I are talking now uh, with the internet, we can connect from Illinois to Colorado. I uh, uh, now can cover Washington in much the same ways I did 30 years ago before I came to Illinois and I was with C-SPAN. So today, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. was speaking on censorship and before the yeah. uh, House Judiciary Committee. And he was saying, uh, I'll, I'll put a clip up on our website uh, shortly, but he was talking about the, the need to restore dignity and professionalism and the relationships uh, in government. And he was saying how his uncle Teddy Kennedy uh, got more things passed than any other l legislator uh, and how he worked with and became friends with people like Orrin Hatch, who, for those who don't remember, was a, a very conservative senator from Utah and uh, politically very much uh, opposed to the same positions that Ted Kennedy had, but yet they they worked together. And uh, Robert Kennedy was saying, I was surprised. Why is my uncle bringing in Orrin Hatch, who he goes, I thought was, I, I used to look at him as Darth Vader, you know, but the it yeah. goes to, to show you had uh, obviously everyone has issues with people. Uh, one thing that people I think should know is that, you know, they think, well, all Republicans like each other and all Democrats like each other. But it's often your biggest nemesis might be a member of your own party. Um, how did you deal, whether a Democrat or Republican, when you're trying to get something as governor passed and, you know, there was someone who just seemed to revel in being a uh, thorn in your side? Well, as governor, I used to say, you, you really need to put the partisanship aside because you had to get things done. And most of the time that I was governor, uh, well, my first two years, which were the most significant probably because we had all kinds of problems when I came in and I was dealing with a democratic controlled legislature. So to get things done, I had to be able to work with Democrats. You had to compromise. Uh, later, I had, uh, one time I had two years of all Republican control, but you still had to work with them. And sometimes you had to pick up some Democrat votes. I mean, it just because you were both Republicans, you and the legislator, didn't mean you always agreed. And sometimes I was as difficult to get the Republicans to go along uh, than it was the Democrats. Because as the governor, often you have to get the legislature to do things they don't want to do, uh, like raise a tax, cut spending. Uh, and, uh, but you're the guy that, that's where the buck stops. You've got to, you know, get things done. You've got to do it in a balanced budget manner. Uh, so uh, the, the governor has the, the chores of, I think, a much tougher job than legislators. Uh, and he's held more responsible for what happens. Uh, you know, things can fall apart and maybe it's the legislature's fault, but usually the governor gets blamed for it. Same at the national level. Uh, if Congress doesn't act and the president uh, tries but can't get it done, he gets blamed for it. So if you're going to get things done, you, you've got to kind of put aside the partisanship and deal with people as individuals and try to see if you can't find something that you both can agree on to, to solve the problem. Uh, now, I ask, sometimes how, I was successful. How much did sometimes you? I how much did you have to do the log rolling, where someone says, "I'll, I'll vote for you if you give me a grant for the local library or something"? It was how much of? Not as much as people think, but more than I wanted to do. Uh, you know, you there were some legislators that uh, you know you knew that they had certain things they wanted, and you knew if 
if you gave them those things, they probably were going to be in a lot better mood to, to do what you wanted. Uh, I didn't have a problem when it came to jobs, though we had very few jobs by the time I became governor, we could give, or projects. Example, state prisons. We unfortunately had to build state prisons, which, you know, now some of those aren't even used. Uh, but uh, that was a great economic boost in downstate communities to get a prison. So legislators really wanted a prison. Well, I didn't mind giving a prison, if we're going to have to build one, and we knew we wanted to put it in a certain part of the state, if corrections would tell me, hey, yeah, this is, this is a good place to put a prison, if that made that legislator happy and I could pick up his vote on something, that was fine. Now, if I had a legislator that wanted a prison and Department of Corrections would say, that's a terrible place to put a prison, it just won't work, I wouldn't do it. Uh, same thing on employing somebody. And again, we, we couldn't really do too much at the lower levels, but at the higher levels we could. And uh, I remember uh, one of the legislative leaders really wanted his person named as director of aeronautics. And I was a little leery because this guy had a tendency to, to send me people that were very, his political cronies, they weren't always maybe the, the best. Uh, I, I went along, I said, well, well, okay, we'll try. He turned out to be the best director of aeronautics I had. So uh, you can get good people uh, recommended to you by other people. Uh, and I, I didn't have a problem with that as long as they did the job. If they didn't do the job, uh, then they were gone. And I probably wouldn't listen to that person next time he had somebody to recommend. Uh, but you have to, you know, you have to meet these people kind of halfway. And some of them aren't just concerned about ideology. They, they want to get something for their community. A budget, probably that's the best example. Uh, the budget, uh, you know, you've got a limited number of dollars you can spend. And I would always submit a budget and say, this is, this is my, these are my priorities. Now, legislators might have different priorities. Uh, and they often did. They always did, actually. <laughs> and you kind of knew that. Uh, and I got, they'd always want to raise your education budget, no matter how much money you ask for, for new spending on elementary and secondary education, the legislature would always want to raise it because they wanted to show they got that money. So I knew that. So I always came in a little low on elementary and secondary because I knew I was going to have to raise it. Uh, but on other like projects, uh, infrastructure, or some people call it pork, things for their districts. Uh, I thought they probably knew is better than I knew what their districts needed. Mm -hmm. And they didn't couldn't get everything they wanted, but we should treat all parts of the state uh, fairly. Now, suburbs never got as much money as they sent to Springfield, because that's where the wealth is in the state. Uh, city of Chicago got about what they sent. Downstate always got more than they sent. Now, they don't believe that downstate, but that was a fact of life. Well, when I was going to deal on the budget at the end, and the budget to me was the most important thing I had to do as governor, is to get a budget through that was responsible, that was balanced and took care of the needs. Uh, because when I came in, we were basically bankrupt and uh, we'd overspent. And so that made me very conscious of the importance of a budget. Uh, but to get that passed, I had to get the legislature to approve it. And there were times that I would have to give them things for their districts or for something that they thought was important. One of the, two of the legislative, they were very concerned about mental health. And there's one facility in particular they wanted to see get help. It wasn't in either one of their districts, but they had connections with that. So you knew that. And it was a reasonable expenditure. I mean, it was a worthwhile program. And so I always felt like I could give them some of that so I could get the budget passed as intact and overall as the way I wanted it. I'd say I usually got 99% of what I wanted in a budget and I'd give them 1% maybe that I didn't really want to do, but it was for projects that we knew were worthwhile. We used to give each caucus a little money, not as much as they, they did after I left. They gave them huge amounts, but we'd give them a little bit of, and I'd go along with those projects as long as they were legitimate projects 
uh, and making sure it wasn't somebody's brother-in-law that was getting the money. We had to, to watch that at times. But maybe they needed a new fire station or they, they needed some work on a road that was very important in that district that DOT didn't have on their priority list. Uh, we, we would go to some extent on that. Uh, so that was part of the compromise you had to do, not only with the other party, but with people in your party, people in the legislature. You know, we, now we, I think many of the legislators, many of the legislators probably thought I wasn't as compromising as they would like me to be. Uh, I did insist that we couldn't spend money we didn't have. That was a kind of a new concept to some of them, and uh, you couldn't come up with funny revenue estimates. I mean, it used to be they every year at the end they they'd want to spend this money and they looked, oh, we don't have enough money. Oh, lottery's going to bring in more money, and they'd up the lottery. Or we're not going to spend that much on. Uh, uh, state employees insurance. In the end, we did spend more on state health care and the lottery didn't bring in those dollars. So it created debt. So we just said we can't do that anymore. And that after they understood I was serious about that. I wanted people to uh, remember, because some won't, that when you came in, as you, you touched on, that the state of Illinois was nearly bankrupt. And so in the first four years, uh, your first term, you and you accomplished getting the state back on a better financial footing. And I think your nickname was Governor No. Mayor Daley gave me that name. Uh, and I, I took it kind of as a compliment, uh, just because I thought that was my job, you know. I, somebody's got to say no. Uh, and uh, now it doesn't make you real popular with legislators or with certain people. Now, overall, the people in the state uh, understood that. I always point out, when I first ran for governor in 1990, it's a very close election, tough. I ran against the Attorney General, Neil Hardigan. Uh, it was, we'd already had Jim Thompson for, what, 16 years, 14 years, whatever. People want, they always change right. parties in this right. state. And, uh, but I won, barely, but I won. And, uh, and one of the things I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the temporary increase in the income tax permanent, which the Democrats said, I'm going to raise taxes. Now, they're the ones that put that temporary tax in, but uh, they've, they didn't mention that when they were attacking me. Uh, but I just said, well, we, we, we can't give it up. I mean, it's going to schools, other places. We, we don't have, we need that revenue, but we're not gonna spend, we're not gonna raise taxes more. We're not gonna spend any more than we take in. And when I did the cuts, uh, the legislature was very hesitant. I mean, it took, we went into overtime, which back then you didn't do. We, we didn't have a budget which I thought was terrible for about f four weeks. Uh, and uh, we got a compromise. We finally got it worked out. Uh, and the public understood that. The public understood you can't spend money you don't have. Uh, much better than the politicians. And so uh, those first four years were tough financially. And as I said, the first two years I had completely control uh, Republic, I mean, Democratic legislature. Second two years, I had a split legislature, which was still as difficult. And, uh, but when I ran for re-election after doing cutting spending, cutting programs, making that tax permanent, going through a very difficult time with Medicaid, uh, I got re-elected by the largest margin anyone's been re-elected in the history of the state mm. for a governor. And I think it was because people understand they don't like, but they understand sometimes you got to do tough things. You got to do things that they don't really like, but it has to be done. Let me go back uh, to so, uh, with, when we got the Edgar Fellows, because I, it seems like a lot of your post governorship has been about educating people, speaking on the issues, uh, trying to see if you, in your own way, you can get government to work better. I, and I, I find myself when I hear people commenting about different things, that part of their opinion on the issues is based on an ignorance of the process or they just don't appreciate, you know, they, they may be, well, that governor, and I'm like, I mean, you can take Rauner, uh, Rauner certainly made uh, mistakes in my estimation, but you also have to say he didn't have a uh, legislature of his own party. Now you also, as you mentioned, were working with the Democratic uh, legislature in the beginning. I think at one point you had what you had uh, always the Democrats had the House, but uh, except for two years, you, 
to you. Uh, the Republicans, we, Madigan got removed as speaker because the Republicans got control of the House for two years. Oh, that's right. That was say, in your term. Yeah. We, we got things done, but it wasn't as much easier than I, th I thought it might be. It wasn't as easy as I thought it might be having a Republican control legislature. Probably the best was when I had one house was a Republican, one house was Democrat, because it kind of kept both extremes from, you know, running roughshod because sat down and tried to work with the leaders to compromise. The Republican leaders could always go back to their caucus and say, we can't get this. Those crazy Democrats control the House and we just can't get it passed. And they kind of understood that. Well, the same thing with the Democrats. They could go back to their caucus in the House and say, ah, we can't get, you know, those Republicans, they're against anything to help people, you know, and we just can't get that much money. And so they both leaders, when we got ready to compromise, they had a way they could go back to their caucuses and say, hey, we're not going to get 100% of what we want. The difficult was when we had all Republican control legislature, which I only did for two years, the kind of the, the far right part of the party says, well, we can get everything we want. We got control of government. Yeah. They wanted to take over the Chicago schools, take over the Chicago airport. I said, I'm not taking over the Chicago schools and we're not taking over the airport. They thought now that we have control. So in some t cases, now I have to say, uh, I think Governor Pritzker, definitely you're better off probably with a republic, uh, legislature controlled by your party than a legislature controlled by the other party. Uh, a split, I think, from my perspective, worked well. Uh, I think Governor Pritzker has benefited from the fact that he controls, that his party controls the legislature overwhelmingly. And you also don't have Mike Madigan anymore to ch be a challenger, to be uh, somebody that has control in, in the House. Uh, you have a new speaker, you have a new Senate president uh, from before, and they both, I think, are good and do a good job. I think they're very smart people. They don't have the ironclad control that a Madigan did. And as a result, the governor has, I think, more influence within his party than he, Governor Pritzker might have uh, if Speaker Madigan was still in his prime and, and being Speaker of the House. Madigan was in his prime when you were dealing with him. What, what in your estimation, accounted? And, and for those who don't know, Mike Madigan was the longest-serving House Speaker in the history of the United States. What accounted for his grip on power? Extremely smart. Next to Jim Thompson, he was the smartest guy I dealt with in my time in Springfield. But he was very focused too, more focused than Thompson, more focused than anybody I knew. I mean, when he kind of set his mind to something or he was gonna deal with this issue, he, he focused in on it. And uh, it, was, it was really, I have to say, I mean, I, I had bypass surgery when I, during my first term for, quadruple bypass. And I said at least one of those bypasses I'm dedicating to Mike Madigan because he <laughs> did make my life difficult because you had to finally get him on board when he had control of one of the houses to get something done. And he took forever to make up his mind or he'd wait on you and try to see if he could outweigh you. And that first session when we went into overtime, we kind of both tried to outweigh each other. And finally, we realized that we both were kind of stubborn and we had a lot of similarities in that regard. And so we, we did work out a compromise. And from then on, we were able to, to get this. But uh, he was, uh, you know, he was very formidable. Uh, he, he didn't let it become personal, which was very important, uh, at least in the times I dealt with it. Now, I think Mike Madigan, when I dealt with him, was very effective. Uh, when we did have agreement on some tough things, I was sure glad to have him on my side to get something passed uh, because it took firm leadership in the legislature to get them to move. And once he said, I'm on board, you didn't have to worry about it. Uh, some of the other leaders, sometimes I had to worry about it, but not with Madigan. Uh, now, I, I can't really speak for how he, the last 20 years, because uh, I wasn't around. Uh, I do think there is a danger for any of us not just in politics, but in the private sector, or any place of leadership or authority, you can overstay. And you can begin to believe your press release, as I always said. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think if I would fault the Speaker Madigan on anything, 
he might have stayed a little too long. And, and I'm not going to get into the legal. I'm, I don't, I'm not a lawyer. And I don't know. I, I do know that my dealings with Maggie, and he was always very conscious of not stepping over what he thought was the line of legality. Uh, now, it was 25 years ago. As I said, people change, and sometimes you stay too long, and you begin to think you can do whatever you want to do. But my experience with him was not that. He, he knew that he had a power, but he also knew at the end of the day, he didn't have total power. And particularly at the end of my last four years as governor, my last two in particular, when he became speaker again, I found him much easier to work with. There were things we couldn't agree on, but there were things we could agree on. And he was also very supportive of holding the line on spending, contrary to what most people would think about Democrats and contrary to what most of his members wanted to do. Uh, but uh, he, he, was a, he, he was very smart and he's very focused. And I think uh, that, and he also was a stickler on you keep your word. If somebody lied to him, he probably never would deal with him again. And I think some of the governors, particularly, I can think of one Democratic governor in particular, had a problem with that. And Madigan and him never did work very well together. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I interviewed Madigan's counsel, who then uh, was uh, managing the impeachment of Governor Bogoyevich, and uh, David Ellis, who is a judge now and also uh, uh, an author. Uh, but David Ellis said in an interview that we did uh, about a year after the impeachment that early on uh, Madigan came not to trust uh, Governor Bogoyevich and never wanted to be in the room alone with him. He always wanted to have someone else there. Uh, we yeah. are in a state now, a uh, state of Illinois, where over the last 10 years or so, uh, it seems that we've been having people moving out of the state. and population keeps going down because of a variety of reasons. Taxes, the cost of doing business, a lot of people think overregulated. You, as a, as we said, you, you spent some time in Colorado, you spent some time in Arizona. Has that given you maybe somewhat of a different perspective on things as you come back to Illinois? And what, what do you think about where we are as a state now being governed and, and what might Illinois be able to do to improve the situation uh, so that we can get more businesses to move here, to build here, um, and for the people to stay here. Because when, when you get 100,000 people leaving the state, that, that adds up to a lot of people pulling their money out of the economy. Now, is that the last census or is that the first one that wasn't accurate? I'm, I'm not sure on those, because I know they came out and they, they didn't lose as many people as they said. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's unique to Illinois. Uh, let me go back first of all based off spending time in Colorado and in Arizona, I think Illinois is a lot better place than maybe I thought before. Hmm. Uh, now, Colorado, I think, has a lot going for it. Arizona, I, its government, uh, you know, their schools, they just don't compare. Even Colorado schools are uh, pretty good. I don't think they compare to Illinois schools. Uh, and uh, Chicago is always a struggle, I think. I mean, you have... Uh, economic issues in Chicago uh, and the schools, I think, uh, are better than they were. I don't think they're as good as they should be. They're better. Uh, but I think in the rest of the state, schools are pretty good. Uh, and again, just we pay more for schools in Illinois than they do in Arizona. And I think we have better schools. And it goes back to, you can lower your taxes. The South, that's great, low taxes. They're, they're the bottom of everything. I mean, I'd hate to see Illinois become Mississippi uh, or even Texas in schools. I mean, I, I just think you get what you pay for. We do pay. I, you can make an argument that maybe there is some waste and there are some things that need to be changed. But I think overall, people should not badmouth Illinois as much as they do. Uh, now, a lot of people are moving out west. I don't know what they're going to do. There's no water out west. Uh, you know, this climate problem is uh, really impacting out there. Uh, Illinois, while we've got a little bit of a drought going through central Illinois right now, uh, we still have water. We, we're the center of the nation. We've got a lot going for us. Can government do a better job? Uh, probably, though I don't think state government right now is doing a bad job. Uh, 
And uh, we'll have to see how the new mayor in Chicago is able to deal with the problems of Chicago. Uh, but I, again, I, I don't think you'll know. Weather, I got to say, uh, it's too cold in the winter and too humid in the summer. Uh, we, I don't know if we can blame government for the climate. Uh, but uh, we do have some things going for us climate-wise, and that's we've got water. Uh, we, we've got, uh, you know, we've got other things like airport. We got a lot of things going for us. And again, I, I don't think it's as bad as people make out. And also, if you look around the country, many states in the Midwest and the Northeast have lost population. It's just this migration to the South and to many seniors like myself. A job's not the key thing. They want warm weather. They want recreation. And uh, those areas offer more opportunities. Uh, I do think well, on the, the property taxes revenues, are pretty crushing. No. Property taxes are high here. Uh, our other taxes are not as high. Property taxes in the suburbs are not as high as they could have been. When we put in uh, back, one of the things we got done when I was governor was uh, we slowed down the increase in property taxes. And for many years, it, it held property taxes uh, pretty constant, and they found ways around it like any... One of the, this is my governmental thing for you. Uh, no, whenever you solve a problem with a new law, and you might solve it, but it's not going to last forever. School aid formula, whatever, you're going to have to go back and redo it. Same thing when we, we put a cap on how much you could increase property taxes in the suburbs. And it did save hundreds of millions of dollars. They figured out after time how to kind of get around that. Uh, but property taxes are much higher here than other states. That's because we fund education through property taxes, oh, elementary and secondary. Uh, most states don't do that. Most states fund it from statewide taxes like the income tax or the sales tax. So uh, I've always thought our property taxes are too high, but that what means you, you have to raise another tax. Let me insert and I tried that. And what, People what do you what do you do think that. on that though? Should uh, should Illinois look to, because you know if you have an income tax, you're you're paying a tax on your income. When you pay a property tax, I mean, as you well know, you might have a, a couple that's retired, and yeah. they're paying nine thousand, fifteen thousand. You know, maybe they can't afford that. Should we move to a funding Illinois education and get get away from the property taxes and, and have it be more of a general tax? Well, I, I think we should. And I tried that. You weren't here yet in Illinois when I tried that, to, to raise the income tax and lower property taxes. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting. And, and now downstate, they wanted to do that because they just don't like property. Farmers, seniors just do not like property taxes. Suburbs where they pay more property taxes, I thought they would be supportive, but they don't didn't want to do that. And the reason, Terry, they thought, one, they didn't think we were really going to lower the property tax. They just thought we were going to end up raising the income tax. Uh, and, you know, there's no guarantee some local government may not try to do that. But the other thing, they did not want the state to have any more control over their schools. Uh, a lot of people in the suburbs moved to the suburbs because they had better schools. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to leave that to Springfield. And Springfield take some of that money that came out of the suburbs and spend it on downstate and their schools wouldn't have as much money to spend. They spent a lot more money. That's why their schools are better. One of the reasons they spent a lot more money per student. Uh, they didn't They didn't want to make it equal. Uh, and I couldn't get the suburbanites to, to go along with it. And they, they had a bigger, big say in the legislature. Uh, so I, I guess I've been through those battles and I wish ideally if we had had the state to start over again. We wouldn't have relied on the property tax to fund education. It's a tough sell. Now, every year we do increase the amount of state money coming in for elementary and secondary education. Uh, but there's still the major part comes from property taxes, particularly in the suburbs. Downstate, the state aid probably is close to the property taxes. They get a lot of state aid. Suburbs don't get much state aid. Because the state aid formula is based on need. And for the most part, suburban school districts, the people there are wealthy or than people, let's say, in the city or in downstate Illinois. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to try to get done. I mean, I was surprised when Governor Prisker wanted to put that tax on millionaires. 
that yeah, he couldn't get that passed because yeah. there aren't that many millionaires. I, I'd run into people, they were adamant against that. I said, oh, how much money do you make? They said, well, but you know, next year they could charge, they could go 500,000 or 100. And I said, okay, but they, they'd have to act. I just, it, it just amazed me because I thought you could, it's just a little dumb demagoguery when you're talking about, we're just going to tax millionaires, we're going to put this tax on millionaires. But I thought that might sell. Well, it didn't. Uh, so again, it's hard to change the revenue structure particularly if you're going to put it to a vote. Uh, it's why it's hard to get property tax levies raised uh, because people don't want to pay more taxes. Uh, you know, you're... But I, I, don't, I don't see that happen in the near future. But back again, I will say that we could cut taxes, property taxes, and cut how much money we spend on schools. But I don't think that's in the best interest of this state. Uh, the other area that you talk about education at doesn't get the support sometimes from the legislature that it should. That's higher education. Illinois probably has one of the best higher education system in the nation. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that continues. Now, you that's talk that's to, where, and again, you, you, were, you went to uh, the U of I after leaving the governorship, but I would agree. I would say that in when I grew up in St. Louis, uh, one of the things we recognized about Illinois were some of the uh, great colleges that were in the state of Illinois. I, I don't remember let the me, numbers, before but- Before we get off that, the other thing, okay, I just sure. I, I saw where Governor Pritzker, on his trip to England, he was selling Illinois. And one of the things he sold, he was really pushing, was our community college system to business leaders. Because community colleges, which we have a, a very good system in Illinois, that's one of the, the pillars of our higher education in Illinois, is they also provide training for employees. And if you talk to business, at least when I was governor, one of the main things they cared about was education and training of people they wanted in their workforce. Well, community colleges are in a good position to provide that kind of training. And I think that's again, a plus we have in Illinois that I don't think, I don't, I think they have community colleges in other states that I've been in and they're fine. I don't know if they have as good a structure as we do in Illinois. And I think studies have shown that Illinois has not only the, the senior institutions like the U of I, uh, Southern, uh, Eastern, Northern, all those, Illinois State, and our private uh, Northwestern University right. of Chicago, Knox. We, we, again, we have a good system here, and, but that costs money. I think sometimes higher education doesn't get the financial support from the state that elementary and secondary what does. I believe I'm right and I don't remember the numbers offhand that we have really taken a lot of money the state has taken a lot of money out of support for higher ed over the last 20 years uh, it hasn't grown it, they've relied on tu tuition which is and why that's, partly why tuition has gone up right right exactly I mean today and it's not unique I mean I two of our grandkids went to school in the uh, University of Colorado. And it, University of Colorado costs the same as going to the University of Illinois if you're a state resident in Illinois. They could go to a private school cheaper, which just amazed me. Because most private schools have built up a pretty good uh, endowment and they provide s s some subsidies uh, for financial aid. Uh, Illinois used to lead the nation in providing financial aid. When I left the governorship, we were ranked number in providing financial aid to students who need it to go to school. Unfortunately, in about five, six years, we'd slip down to being like 20th. And I don't, I don't know where we are now. I, I think it's coming back a little, but you know, those are the kind of programs that are very important. I think we maintain And Again, I think Illinois has a history of doing a pretty good job in that area. I, I think in the last 20 years, unfortunately, we, we, we didn't do as much as we should have done uh, in that area. Uh, we had, <laughs> There's no doubt we had some budgetary issues. We had some governors who didn't see the need to get a budget. And, you know, just we had a whole host of problems that you know, hit higher education. I was going to. You know, on the, budget, on the budget, I just one last thing, since I know you can edit me out. Uh, in the round mission, we didn't have a budget. We did have money for elementary and secondary education. Right. They did pass that. Right. Uh, but they didn't pass money for higher education. And so higher education really had a tough two, three years there that I'm not sure they completely have recovered. And I'm not necessarily talking about the U of I. U of I gets taken care of. I worry about the other universities 
and I worry about the community colleges because they don't quite have as strong as lobby in Springfield. And sometimes they get overlooked. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's very important that we have all those institutions functioning very well in this state. Yes. And, you know, I have a master's from American University, but I tell people I also went to community college for two years and it, it, it helped when you're getting the basics out of the way. Uh, I could go to a community college when I was living at home with my parents and uh, just the cost per hour was uh, less. So uh, not only that, but we have now so many people, you, we're talking now as a society about artificial intelligence coming out. We went through the internet revolution. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that the pace of change, I think happens in society now faster than it did when we were growing up. And so people might, you know, lose a job if, uh, because of technology. They need a place where they can go and they don't want to get a four year degree. They want to go back and maybe retrained on how to do a websites or something else that they can pick up in a semester or a year and then get back into the workforce uh, having been retrained. So it seems to me that the demand for community colleges is, is still as I used it, but uh, you know, affordability, but also that we need to retrain the workforce uh, at, at a faster pace than we had historically. So. I agree. And I think, again, that's why I think community colleges are a very important part. And I think we have that in Illinois. There's, uh, you know, I, I'm back on the tax problem. And I think our biggest problem, and I'd ask people, they mainly are pretty wealthy people or we're moving our residency. It wasn't the income tax. It was the inheritance tax. And I've never quite understood why we got out of step with going along with the federal approach on the uh, uh, yeah. inheritance tax. That's most of the people, wealthy people who've moved to, to, to Arizona or Florida where they're resident or Texas, it's because the inheritance tax in Illinois is, was out of whack. And that I think needs to be looked at and dealt with. Uh, our income tax, uh, is not as high as some places that people go to. Uh, now, you've got to be conscious of taxes. I think you've seen people move out of the Chicago metro. Some of it has to do with crime, too. Right. And I think that's an issue that uh, I think all big uh, industrial cities are dealing with. Uh, we're not alone. But that's that's probably is the priorities, making those communities, people feel safe even in the suburbs where maybe they aren't as threatened as they think, but they see it every night on the television and they hear stories. That I think is caused, I know it's caused a huge exodus from the city of Chicago to the suburbs. Yeah. Uh, and maybe they, a lot of them have gone over the state line to Indiana or whatever. Which is so I think crime, crime is an issue that, uh, you know, that uh, has to be dealt with. And that, again, that's the new mayor in Chicago has, I think a major challenge in that area. Uh, to get something done and get the confidence of the people that he is getting something done. That was a major issue in the campaign. Now, he was able to win, even though I thought that might cost him the election, but he was still able to win. Uh, but I think that's going to be a major challenge. And it is, and it, if Chicago has a major challenge, then it impacts the state. I mean, uh, I know a lot of downstaters say, well, that's Chicago. Well, we don't want to get rid of Chicago because that's the economic engine that runs the state. Uh, we'd be just kind of like Mississippi if we got rid of this Chicago and their suburbs. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to be Mississippi. I, I do find, uh, well, let me ask, when, when you left uh, the governorship and we had uh, the Republicans holding on to the governorship uh, after you left, uh, George Ryan came in. So the Republicans had the governor's office for 25 years. Uh, your eight were part of that before it went over to Blagojevich, and now the Democrats have held it for uh, almost the last 20 years, except for Rauner's four. Rauner's four did, years. Did you have any uh, contact with the uh, governors after you left office? Oh, some. I, I didn't have much contact with Governor Ryan. We didn't, we were, we knew each other, but we just, I didn't, we didn't deal. He didn't, he really, you don't necessarily always want the last governor to be, part of your thing, and that was fine. Uh, I didn't deal with Bogorovich. I just didn't feel comfortable. I mean, he did name me chair of the Lincoln Library thing, but that was an understanding. 
this is the last time he called me about the Lincoln Library, and he did. I have to say, he, he never tried to force anybody on me or anything like that, but I, he just, I just wasn't my type. Uh, Quinn, I dealt with some. I tried to help Governor Quinn, and he'd call, and, you know, we, we are different individuals. We have different perspectives, but I think he tried. Uh, I think after uh, the problems with Governor Ryan and Bogorovich, uh, I think that uh, Quinn was a breath of fresh air. Though I, I'm never sure that Pat Quinn was cut out to be governor. He was more of a bomb thrower. And I told him, I said, you're not a bomb thrower anymore. You, you've got to catch them now. And that's a whole different thing. Uh, governor Rauner, uh, I thought when he first got elected, I thought this guy, you know, he, he, he fits the mold for a Republican to be successful in Illinois. Fiscally conservative, but moderate on social issues. Uh, but then he went off on a tangent on this budget thing and, you know, was trying to get everything he wanted on business issues that he wasn't going to get from a Democratic controlled legislature. He wasn't going to get Mike Madigan to basically gut the, the labor union system in this state. That just wasn't going to happen. Uh, but he, I think, made a huge mistake there. And I think that cost him. And if he had conducted himself as governor, as he indicated he was going to when he was running in the general election, uh, I think he could have been reelected. I think a moderate Republican, meaning fiscally conservative, moderate on the social issues, who is willing to work with the other party to get things done, can be successful in Illinois. But you can't go to the far right and be able to win for governor in Illinois. That's just not going to happen in our lifetime, uh, I don't think. Of course, my lifetime isn't going to be all that long, but yeah, I, I just I don't think that's going to happen. And so. Uh, I, well, that, I you, you kind of anticipated, uh, I mean, the yeah. question I was going to say, well, it, on the on the Republicans, when we look, uh, the Republican Party of Illinois has no none of the constitutional officers now. We're losing congressional seats. DuPage County used to be able to offset Cook County to some extent. Now, as we said, people are moving out of Chicago and they're still voting Democratic. So DuPage County is moving increasingly Democrat. Uh, what can the Republican Party uh, in Illinois do to regain some power? Because primarily it's a downstate party now. It is. I mean, it's it's more Republican downstate south of I-80 than it was when I was governor. I mean, downstate used to be swing. Now it's, I always say a bad candidate can carry downstate by 10, 15 points. Uh, but you can't win elections with that. And the big problem for the Republican Party has been We've lost votes in the suburbs. Not only people moving in voting Democrat, we've got people who used to vote Republican now vote Democrat. Uh, when the Supreme Court uh, threw out Roe versus Wade, that had a huge impact in suburbia, particularly DuPage County. We had an excellent candidate running for president of the county board in DuPage County, who would have been, you know, one of the people on our farm team for a statewide office. Uh, he barely lost, and he lost on the abortion issue. Even though he was pro-choice, there was enough of a swing from voters who usually would vote Republican in DuPage because of that issue that cost his election and many other Republicans down the ballot. Uh, and so the party cannot be perceived in the suburbs to be successful as a party of the far right. And unfortunately, that is the perception. Now, off-year elections uh, should have been a good Republican year with a Democrat in the White House. And it wasn't in Illinois, in the suburbs, where it should have been. So, as I said, we, as a party, do better in the suburbs. The numbers just aren't there for the Republican Party to be a viable party statewide. Uh, we'll continue to be, uh, you know, we'll do very well downstate. Uh, but we we won't be able to win statewide. Yeah. Uh, before we let you go, and I know you got something coming up here. Any th quick thoughts on the uh, Republican presidential run, or, or just the presidential <laughs> run in general? <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I it's no secret in this state that I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, uh, and uh, I think right now it looks like Donald Trump's going to be the Republican nominee, even with all his indictments and everything, uh, that he very well can win. The, the primary path to, to be the nominee. Uh, and one of the dilemmas, I think, in politics is primaries. 
uh, both parties. The extremes in both kind of dominate in a primary. The Democrats, you got to go to the left. I think we see that to some extent right now. You, you didn't ask, I, we didn't get to talk about the Governor Prisker. I think he's done a pretty good job. Uh, I mean, he had a tough thing with COVID. That was just, I, you know, everything else was minor he had to deal with compared to COVID. And I thought nobody had been through that before. I, I thought he, he gave it his best shot. Wasn't popular with a lot of it. I give him high marks for that. Uh, but one of the things that I, I'm kind of disappointed that he is looking at the presidency, which I don't blame him for. Uh, but you look to the presidency in the Democratic Party, you have to move left. And I think that makes him more, uh, much more of a progressive, I guess is the term they use, uh, than I think probably be good for the state. I think the state needs a governor that's kind of in the middle. So if I fault him on anything, I think his looking, keeping his eye on the possible shot at running for the president uh, has uh, made him a little more liberal than I think probably is best for the state. Now, on the other hand, in the Republican primaries, uh, because you have fewer of those moderate, who used to be moderate Republicans vote in the Republican primaries anymore. Most of my friends who, people who work for me who are Republicans, they're now not. They, they either vote in the Democratic primary, they don't vote. Uh, and so that makes those candidates move to the left, right more. So that makes it very difficult here in both. So that affects the presidential thing. Right now, I look at who's running for president on the Republican ticket. The only one I think right now I could tell you I could vote for is probably the former governor of Arkansas, Hutchinson. I think he, you know, he's probably makes more sense to me. I think the others Asia are- Asia Hutchinson. Uh, Hutchinson. Hush, yeah. yeah. Yeah, is it Hutchinson? I'm not in Syria. His name doesn't get mentioned enough for me to really, but uh, you know, I think he seems like a, he's been a governor. He's been a congressman. He's, he's worked in the uh, administration of, of W. Bush. Uh, he, he's, uh, I think, a very, seems like a competent, rational guy. Uh, the others, though, are all over there trying to, most of them anyway, pick up the votes if Trump falters. And right now, I don't think Trump's going to falter. So I think it's a good chance we could have a rerun. Now, I, I know a lot of people that know a lot more about national politics than I do, both Republicans and Democrats, who keep saying they don't think Joe Biden will be the nominee. I, I think it's getting awful late to say that. It's like I'm those saying of that. us I, Republican. I, I, I say that. Yeah, yeah. That's, well, that's like a lot of Republicans said, well, it won't be Donald Trump, a lot of party leaders, but rank and file says it I is. Just, so you know, we saw I, something about having Trump and Biden again. It's just, I, you know, I just think that's that's unfortunate. Yeah, it's um, it, it's interesting. It's fun. There's a fun part of uh, politics. It just seems to me I get frustrated because I want things to get fixed. I want problems to get fixed. And, we're not. We're never going to run out of problems, and it would be nice to have the have the government functioning uh, n not in a kumbaya way. You want to have some differences, but you know, just more to where we're getting. You know, at the national level, we're not even passing budgets anymore. We're we're just. Well, we've never passed budgets for years, though. Really, I mean, they do, well, there's doing, those continuing. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's it's, not just under yeah, Biden. It's just, it's just it's we've just been typically doing these con you know, continuing resolutions, and they're not. They, I mean, they've been fiscally irresponsible because they got a printing press. Uh, I I will say, I was glad they got the infrastructure bill passed. I thought that was very important. Uh, they did do some things to on COVID to help. I think they went overboard to some extent. I mean, yeah. I only wish I could have been governor when the state was sending Illinois billions of dollars. I mean, usually this, when I was governor, the federal government was causing us to spend billions of dollars we didn't have on things like Medicaid and other programs. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I wish I could say, I think we're gonna get over this polarization. Uh, I had hoped after the last presidential election, and I thought Trump was gonna exit the scene and, you know, Biden was an old timer that, you know, reached across the aisle, knew how to do that from his days in the Senate, we'd get away from. But uh, unfortunately, there's just too much hatred in politics these days. I don't know what else to call it. And uh, everybody thinks the other guy's evil. And again, back to Edgar, that's one of the things Edgar Fellow, we try to convince folks, look, just because that person has a different point of view doesn't mean he's a bad person. Right. And one of the things I learned, particularly as governor, uh, there is often to solve a problem, there's not just one solution. There's different things that can be done. Uh, 
And so if you don't get 100% of what you wanted, if you had to compromise to get it, chances are that, comp and many times that compromise position worked better than if I'd have got what I wanted 100% or vice versa, if the, the other party had got 100% of what they wanted. Uh, because it, it takes into consideration all the different points of view in the country and I think in the state. And I think that's important when you're creating public policy, that public policy reflects a lot of different points of view. And I think it's more accepted. And if it's accepted, chances are it's got a better chance of being successful. So unfortunately, I, I, I'm not as optimistic as I was maybe after the election uh, three years ago that we might get back to that nationally. Uh, I think in, in, if we go through the same election we had four years ago, I'm afraid that's just going to continue the polarization uh, and the uh, inability to, to bring the parties together. Now, I do think the majority of the people, uh, they did vote for the current president. Uh, I think, unfortunately, and I'm not a fan of how, how we elect the United Senate. I mean, I think it's distorted now. Uh, I don't think a voter, and I think a voter in Illinois ought to have the same clout that a voter in North Dakota does in the Senate, but they don't. I mean, we get a, per, per population here, we get a lot less bang for our buck than they do in North Dakota or in Mississippi or wherever. So as a result, we can get a minority government as we had under, uh, round, uh, under uh, Trump. He, he didn't win most votes. The Senate didn't represent the most people, and they appointed a Supreme Court that didn't represent most of the people. So, you know, I think we have a problem there, but I, I don't see that being solved in the near future. Yeah. No. So I guess we'll end this without saying we ha we can we can come back and do this many times because I think, unfortunately, many of these problems are going to continue. But I do think when it comes to the state of Illinois, I think Illinois is a lot better place than a lot of folks in Illinois uh, give it credit for. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the problems we face are, we can solve them. Uh, and I think gradually we have begun to solve some of them. I think we got to be careful we don't go too far either way, right or left. This state to be successful still has to go down the middle and to the Republican Party until we get back more to the middle, we're going to be kind of left out. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I just do hope that uh, Republicans will recognize we need to nominate candidates who can win in the fall, both nationally and at the state level. I think that would help the Republican Party. And I think as a people, we need to be more tolerant and we need to understand that we have to accept other points of view. This country today, this state is so different made sociology, I mean, made up than when I was growing up. I mean, this is a very diverse state, very diverse country, a lot of different points of view. We uh, white people don't control things like we used to, and we, we've got to recognize that. All right, well, Governor, we appreciate it as always talking with you. And uh, Okay, good to visit with look, you, Terry. Look forward to doing it again sometime. Okay, thank you. Thank you.